This week, a special episode. We're all Oshkosh all the time. And I'm here on the AOPA grounds in front of the 39 Lounge. And if there's noise in the background, some of the performers are out today. We've got Aeroshell flying some laps. we got the Ford Tri-Motor out. And general aviation pilots are coming and going. All right, David, you ready to do some hangar talk? Let's see if we can do some hangar talk live from AirVenture. From AOPA, your freedom to fly. This is Hangar Talk. The 1056 turn right heading 130, contact final 132.4. Welcome to Hangar Talk, everybody. I'm Ian Twombly. And I'm David Tillis. David, no guests this week. We're going to do all Oshkosh all the time, uh, like we normally do, like we've done for the past couple of years. Uh, you're there at the show. Looks like it's a beautiful day, blue sky behind you. Um, so how's, how's it been so far? Well, Ian, so far there has been a, a lot of news here at AirVenture, as there usually is. I'm going to say most of the, the news is high wing news this year, which is unusual. Mm-hmm. We started the week with a little bit of iffy weather. We'll get to that in a minute, but it's very upbeat. Listen, Ian, they had Women Venture on Wednesday with the largest crowd ever of female aviators. Oh, awesome. The showgrounds were packed. Eric Blinderman and I flew in in the Cessna 172. We parked on the North 40. And I would say the mood is upbeat. Most people are pretty psyched to be here. And uh, it, we're seeing more of a return to normalcy here at Air Venture. And speaking of returning to, to normalcy, I went ahead and dropped 350 bucks with my good friends at my go flight on some accessories. <laughs> and I know a lot of people are nice. shopping here at, at Oshkosh. Very nice. Okay. But the show started on kind of a somber mood. And that's because it, longtime it did, chairman, um, the family really that started EAA, Tom Poberezny, passed away. What the, the was it the night before the morning of the first day of Oshkosh this year? It was on the 25th, and Ian, I was here for the opening day air show, and part of that air show was a fitting tribute, a missing man formation to Tom Pavaresny. And, you know, Mark Baker mourned him along with most of the aviation community. As you know, AirVenture wasn't even called AirVenture until he got involved with it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's been a family thing, and they've grown it to such a a large, you know, event. It's the world's largest general aviation event. They like to say on the tower behind me, it's even posted, you know, the world's busiest air control tower. Yeah. So yeah, yeah that's right. Folks did yeah. warn him, but you probably know more about Tom Poprezny than me. Um, but although I was, at, um, you know, I got involved in aviation in the year 2000 and definitely joined EAA at that time. So I, I was yeah. certainly aware of him. Yeah. I mean, EAA really was the Poprezny's organization. I mean, his dad, Paul started it. Um, Tom, you know, carried the flame. It was, it was a family company. I, they, uh, they grew a lot under Tom's leadership. Uh, the story that you'll see on AOPA.org talks about that, you know, young Eagles program, air venture, sport pilot. A lot of that has to do with Tom. Um, he retired what, I don't know what it was, maybe 10 years ago now. Um, and there was that transition that they had to go to go through from a family company to a, a professionally, I don't want to say Tom wasn't professional, but, but an outside management, let's call it. Um, but one thing that, that people don't talk about a lot anymore really is Tom's flying. And so the story talks about this, the, I remember they, you know, the Christian Eagles, uh, when I was a kid for them performing at the show, he was a really accomplished pilot. I had no idea that he actually was an air show pilot. He was on several different air show teams, and I think it's mm-hmm. a, it's, it's fitting. I mean, that makes sense. I was involved in the home business, also, uh, you know, in, in performing and to hear to uh, air bench. And, and Tom knew a lot about aviation from the different facets he was involved in. Yeah. And uh, we're shown here on the screen, it's like him and Charlie Hilliard and Gene Susi flying those. They're in front of the Eagles, the Christian Eagles. And I just remember they were loud and oh, it was so cool. Uh, they flew together for 25 years. So pretty amazing stuff. And that's a, as we go that's through a just great run. This, that's a great run. Yeah, it is amazing. So you can see here, if you're watching the YouTube version, uh, just going through some of the slides from the photo, from the, the story. Um, he's reviewing plans for the Aviation Center, you know, grew the museum under his leadership. Uh, so just, uh, an incredible legacy and, and a sad day to, to open the show. Yeah. And you know, that, uh, museum this year, Ian, for the first time has the pilot proficiency center 
inside the museum um, at yeah. 3000 Pabaresny Way. So absolutely uh, a great loss for GA, but um, his legacy lives on. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So um, the show must go on, of course, and uh, I'm sure that uh, Tom is a firm believer in that. And one thing that's special that's happening at the show this year, and I, th I don't think we've ever done it before, AOPA, is uh, the sweeps winner is coming to pick up his airplane at the show. That's right, Ian. Alex Brown from California, uh, who was surprised by Mark Baker and Colin Sagnito just about a week ago, is going to be here at the AOPA campus to pick up that uh i see it right across the way that grum and tiger it, I, right now it has a big red bow on the top of it you know who wouldn't want to have something like that in their hangar or on their ramp but he'll be here yeah. at um, the pilot town hall we're going to present that aircraft to um, mr brown and i understand he is going to fly it home to california uh, some of his family members will be here ian they're going to go home commercially. He's going to get some experience with one of our pilots and get checked out in it so that he can have all the time necessary for his insurance. And so uh, hmm. we're really excited for him. And that's going to happen here in a couple hours as we record this. Very cool. So playing a video here, you can see the, the whole ruse. So I went out to California, yeah, Chris Rose and Nikki Britton. Under the guise of talking about backcountry, uh, a backcountry interview, he's got, a, I think, what is it, a 185 and a 180? It's um, great. Yeah, he's a, he's already got a couple of pieces couple of, of airplanes. aviation gear. Yeah. I'll take one of them, Alex. You know, yeah, that's right. Know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Mark and yeah, Colin, yeah. as you mentioned, came up to uh, to congratulate him. And uh, it's so cool, I think, that he's coming to the show to pick up the airplane. That's a really special thing. Um, so just a really, I think, nice guy, uh, super excited to win. He said he's excited to use the airplane, uh, to, I think, give back to the local aviation community. So maybe fly some kids around that sort of thing. Um, but you know, next year, if you didn't win, we already got the next sweeps airplane. It's already at the show. It's at the show, Ian. And, um, uh, folks who will be uh, looking at our api.org channel we'll see probably uh later today or later in the week there was uh, we had the night air show last night wednesday night air show and i photographed that and i've got a really nice photo of fireworks over the cesta 170 it's here that was in honor of mike collins who shot a tremendous cesta 170 photo a couple of years ago here uh with fireworks but yes the cesta 170 is here eric webb flew it up uh kayla mcleod helped uh, procure it and get some uh, work done on it down in Georgia. And they are going to fly that out of here in a couple of days. Uh, it's it's here. It's red. If you haven't seen it, it's it's white and red. And it will, I'm not sure it's going to stay those colors, though. I'm thinking it's going to be upgraded. Probably the be painted. Looks, yeah. Yeah, the interior is in good shape. We're going to we're gonna make it into an interesting backcountry aircraft. But I understand we're not going to go over the top with it. We're going to keep it in its element. Um, and so that's here at the AOPA campus. Real quick, let me just mention at the AOPA campus for folks who haven't been able to come to visit us here, maybe we'll see you next year, but I wanted to let you know, we are having a pilot town hall. Mark Baker is going to mm -hmm. speak the 200th flying club. Those folks are going to be introduced. That's um, a place out in uh, Lake Shelby, Illinois. We went and visited them on the way up here. Eric Flinderman and I flew out there. So we're really excited that um, that Tim and his group are going to be here for that. I also wanted to let people know, Ian, you know, I know you were busy this week where I subbed for you on Ask the A&Ps. Yes. Thank we you had for a doing live, that. You're welcome. We had a live session here uh, mm -hmm. with with Mike Bush, um, Paul New, and Colleen Sterling. It was fantastic. Standing room only. Yes. And I've, I've already fielded a request for another live event like that next year. So yes, I definitely think we're going to do it next year. Yep. We're going to, so if you haven't checked out, ask the A&Ps before, please do so. It's um, on the AOPA website under the hangar, under the uh, podcast page. And, uh, or you can go out and find it wherever you obviously get podcasts, maybe where you get hangar talk, but check it out because especially for owners and even renters, if you're first starting out and wanting to learn a little bit more about maintenance, it's a, it's an awesome show. Um, people call it car talk for aviation. And I, you know, I like to think that it's more interesting than car talk, but you know, that's because I like airplanes more than cars. It was um, a lot of fun. It was great. Yeah, hey, yeah. can I and give they, a shout out to one of our listeners for Hangar yeah, Talk? Yeah, go for it. 
Yeah. So um, Greg Schroeder visited us, visited us live here uh, during the Ask a and Peace, and we we fielded a question from a former guest, Lincoln Benedict, mm-hmm. um, which was great. So you know, people had a, a really fun time with that, Ian. Yeah. And we also, of course, we have serious presentations as well. Richard McSpadden was talking about backcountry short takeoff and landing events. We had some social media folks here that were talking about you know how to build an audience. Um, mm-hmm. And we also have our, our core of AOPA workshops and seminars that folks come to depend on us for every year. And yeah. we have a virtual reality um, set up inside for younger people. It's great cool. to see a lot of young people. You know, I also want to mention at EA Air Venture, and, and the Pop Resonies were, um, were involved with this too, and Jack Pelton last year declared he would do this you know, from years forward. Folks under 18 got in free this year and last yeah, that's year. Awesome. So that's yeah, yet that's another great. legacy great. I thought I'd mention. So we see a lot of young people out here. Yeah, that's good. And so, um, by the way, that A&P session will be on the stream. So if you missed it live and you want to hear it oh, uh, and hear yeah. and, and this, I love this because they were, you know, they're professionals, right? Uh, Paul owns a shop. Mike's got Savvy Aviation and Colleen teaches a and ps at a school, also an IA. Um, and she has assessed a Cardinal once. Yeah. Yeah. They were so nervous about getting these questions, uh, these pop-up questions. And uh, I thought they handled them great. So check that out on the li- on the, on the feed. On the yeah, AMPs folks feed. can get that. Yeah. They didn't have mm-hmm. to be here to listen to it. We're going to post it. Uh, Ian, yep. how could they find that? Where could they find the Ask a and ps on the podcast and and there's maybe going to be a tv link too a youtube link yeah yeah so yeah it's just uh just go to aopa.org and search ask the amps or yeah go out to itunes and uh you know apple podcasts or or spotify or wherever you listen so yeah absolutely there were but some good questions really good yeah questions. there were there were yeah. um so getting off Oshkosh just for a minute, uh, okay. I want to talk about just a, a, I know it's a bit of a downer, but something that's been really important to AOP and I know a lot of members over the past couple of years, and that is FBO fees. So recently announced Signature, which had been reluctant to post their fees online, mm-hmm. has done so now. They've gone all in. They, they had posted a few kind of here and there at a few locations, but they've finally gone all in. World's largest FBO chain. This is a, this is a really big deal uh, and a big deal for transparency, David. Well, it is, Ian, and, and it still is topical to Oshkosh because a lot of folks who flew up here probably either passed through a signature FBO mm-hmm. or they are ripped or based at a signature FBO like I was for a long time in Atlanta mm. at PDK. Yeah. But, you know, making those pricing structures uh, transparent is something we've been trying to do for a long time. And Signature was resistant to it. And, you know, recently they acquired TAC Air. And I wonder mm-hmm. if that might have been some of the impetus for getting that going. That was yeah, a big uh, consolidation we talked about last week when Alyssa subbed in for you mm. um, while you were where you were away. But um, I'm thinking that that's really a good thing. We're going to know how much is it cost if there's a landing fee involved. It, you know, maybe, maybe based on the size of the aircraft, the weight of the mm-hmm. aircraft. Yeah. Is there something that we could find out ahead of time? But now these fees will be posted. You can find them on our airport directory, by the way. That's just a reminder to use the AOPA airport directory. And you can also find some of that through our AOPA app if you're mobile. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so a big win um, for the GA community, for transparency, and, and hopefully, of course, the idea being not only are you not surprised when you go to a location, but maybe some of this transparency is going to drive a little bit of competition and, and push sure. down these prices in some areas. Sure, so, absolutely. And, you yeah. know, it's, it's a good thing for all of aviation, for everyone to get on board. Let's not land and be surprised by a $50, you know, mystery fee like like yeah. that's happened to some folks or even more. Yes. So I think yes. it's a great thing. They're on board. Let's, you know, moving on, I think uh, we'll, we'll hope, hopefully we'll find more transparency for a few of the holdouts in the industry. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's bring it back to Oshkosh. That's the fun stuff. Uh, bring it back to my, look, here's my Dunkin' yeah. Donuts Oshkosh coffee. And this is like a thermal <laughs> mug, so it'll keep it hotter, keep it cold. It, it was only $20. And only. If you've been to Oshkosh, you know, yeah, everything is 20 or 50 bucks, right? Yeah. Yeah, except for the except for the brats, which are only ten, right? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, you know, in recent years, I would say Oshkosh has been there's been a lot of avionics, right, a- across actually all shows, Sun and Fun, Oshkosh, whatever. A lot of a lot of the announcements have been avionics based. There's a lot of development going on. 
that I think maybe because of supply chain has slowed down a little bit. But and so this right. year is actually the year of the airframe. Mm -hmm. And uh, one that was just announced just prior to the show that is really cool. We always love talking about is the Kodiak. And there's a new one. Yeah, the Kodiak 900. Uh, Tom Haynes, I'm going to call him editor emeritus. There Tom you go. Haynes. Yeah, I like that. Uh, he was uh, able to travel out to um, Kodiak land with Chris Rose and they did a really nice report on the 900. I want to say it looks like a fat guppy version of the previous Kodiak, <laughs> but it has, it has a built in belly pod, you know, yes. it, it has more performance packed into it. And then, you know, they're owned by Dar. I'm probably mispronouncing the French company uh, based out in Idaho, mm -hmm. but it's a back country beast, Ian. And mm -hmm. it could um, it could true out at 205 knots while burning about 430 pounds of jet fuel per hour. Tom wrote in a recent story, mm -hmm. and yeah, the um, Oshkosh was used as the jumping off showcase for that aircraft. We got a yeah. a preview look um, at the airplane earlier, and I want to say it's got an upgraded 700 shaft horsepower Pratt and Whitney yeah. PT6A. Yeah. yeah. Bigger engine. So they did a bigger engine. Um, I think they worked on, um, well, the big thing is the fairing apparently on the, on the belly mm -hmm. pod. So that's not going to be belly standard. Pod you can, fairing. Yeah. Right. If you can, you can see it in the video now, it looks integrated. And so it is kind of a guppy look. Um, maybe not, uh, the prettiest look ever, but I do think it'll be popular. They, it's not replacing the 100. It'll be okay. an addition to, um, so this is the, you know, TBM used this strategy with the two airplanes. Um, it always surprises me, but you know, you're talking about what 35 knots, um, a longer cabin, which I think is important. They said it can accommodate uh, a couple of double club, which I guess in some parts of the world, maybe in yeah, an airline configuration, 37, 37 additional inches. That's three yeah. feet. Yeah. That's not insignificant, right? <laughs> that's yeah. Big. Yeah. 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 So they're going to continue to offer both models. Um, I think the 900 is going to go for, what did they say about a half a million more? I think I would not be surprised to see it vastly outsell the 100. That's what happened with TBM. Um, so it is, uh, it's a cool airplane. I, you've seen these in person. They are, they're deceptively large. Yeah. They deceptively are. large. Yeah. Aircraft. But you know, what's interesting, it's big, but it's still able to handle those backcountry strips. And, uh, you know, think yeah. about 12 passengers in that club setting with, you know, it's just a versatile cabin. It could really yeah. be put to use in places like maybe Alaska, points mm -hmm. overseas, yes. you know, um, unimproved uh, landing strips maybe in Africa where folks really need general aviation to get yeah. around. Something like this. It's like a, a multi-tool in your tool belt for yeah. that kind of aviation. Yeah, well, and David, I was just, you know, the reason that Alyssa filled in for me is I was on vacation. We flew between a couple of islands. Uh, we did it in a Saab 340 because there were uh, like whatever that is, 32 passengers or whatever. But I could see on islands that were less populated, uh, this would be a great back and forth shuttle between these islands. You know, one of these commuters that runs, you know, five times a day sort of thing. Sure. Um, do it economically. So, yeah, I, I could see some sales for them in, in that area. Absolutely. Um, well, absolutely. Very cool airplane. That's Absolutely. It is a cool airplane. Speaking of airplanes, speaking of turbines, let's talk about Avgas for a while and move okay. on to the, the fuel let's form. Let's talk about it. Let's do it. Here. So we had a fuel form here at AOPA Air Venture. Folks who have listened to me and Ian talk a little bit about, uh, you know, 100 unleaded fuel and uh, what we're trying to do to get the lead out of it know that we've mm -hmm. been participating in the PAPI process for years and years. We're in part of the Eagle initiative. Um, mm -hmm. And we now have a deadline to get unleaded, to get the lead out of aviation fuel by a certain date. So up here at Air Venture, Mark Baker and several other GA leaders participated in a fuel forum. And mm -hmm. it was pretty popular. I would say it was a packed house over yeah. in the, uh, the forums area. And it is one of the most important issues facing general aviation today. That's what yes. Mark Baker said when he opened it up. Yep. And we had speakers from the FAA. And we also had in the audience someone who's been on our show before, George Brawley from GAMI, yes. who has a G100 yeah. UL. And I, I, Chris DaCosta from Swift Fuels in the audience as well. 
Those mm -hmm. are uh, two fuels that are vying for, you know, for GA. And also yeah. we want to let people know, as you have mentioned many times, we are fuel agnostic. We want yeah. the best fuel for everyone, what's going to work with everybody's aircraft and everyone's engine. And so people in the audience had some good questions, Ian. They wanted to know about the fungibility of that, which we have explained a couple of times. Yes, these fuels will mix with what you have in your airplane mm -hmm. already. Mm -hmm. That is the yeah. whole point. And um, there was a little bit of back and forth. But Ian, you know, I don't know that people left convinced. I'm going to be honest with you. I was there <laughs> listening. <laughs> you don't think the one session got them, huh? I don't uh, think so. I think some of it goes yeah. over folks' heads, but this is very important. Yeah, it is. Well, of course, I mean, you're talking about something that um, from a just from a chemistry standpoint is extremely complicated. Um, and so, you know, the, it's like we would love to wave our wand and say, OK, here's the fuel. It's ready to go and we're going to start shipping it tomorrow. But of course, that's just not a reality at this point. And that's the whole point of Eagle is that you get these stakeholders together to try and get down the road. And I think one thing, if you read the quotes and you kind of read between the lines a little bit from the story, you you understand that the the reason that you have to have an initiative like this is because there are competing interests. You know, you've got people who don't want to see changes, who are making money maybe at the fuel that they're selling. You've got people who are trying to innovate a little bit. You've got the manufacturers who I think are probably a little, well, they're just very cautious through this process. So it's uh, it's not easy. I mean, you do, really do have to get all of these people together uh, in order to uh, to push this process forward. And that takes time. And it can be frustrating, I think, if you're watching this from, uh, you know, as a, as a consumer, as a pilot. And uh, But it, it, it is what it is. And we have to go through this process. We have to get everybody together and on board. Um, a couple of things I thought were interesting also were, you know, the FAA was in attendance and uh, without irony said that there shouldn't be any barriers to the process and that it should move along smoothly, even though they are the regulator. So, um, yeah, we, we will see. But it was good. I think even having a, a session like this and standing sure. before the crowd yeah. taking questions, yeah. that shows, I think, a, 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 a sense of um, openness. Of and the, yeah, yeah, it's a sense of duty. It's a sense of transparency. And that's yeah. the other thing. We were just talking about signature being transparent. We want to be transparent with pilots as well. You know, the deadline is 2030 to get uh, the lead out of aviation fuel. So we have a hard deadline. Mm -hmm. And I, in case folks haven't been paying attention to the Eagle initiative, it is the Eliminate Aviation Gasoline Lead Emissions Initiative, E-A-G-L-E. You can find it at aopa.org slash 100 UL. So um, folks could do a little search for that. But we do have a deadline. And some of the stuff yes. that um, I've been covering, and we've had some meetings in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere, what we had up here, Ian, was a chance to unveil it to the public and uh, be yeah. uh, transparent about what's going on and let people know that we are working behind the scenes and this is what we're trying to do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great point. David, what uh, what is going on? Who is singing in the background? I have to know what. <laughs> What's happening? It's like, you know, it's something out of the 1940s, Ian. Let me look it around and like see it. what we got going on here at Air Venture. Yeah, I, I see the Ford Tri-Motor flying over there in the cool. background. And it just landed, actually. And, you know, it's I think it's a morning, kind of the morning wake-up. Hey, can I mention one thing about the morning wake-up that, yeah. that I did the other day? This was yes. great. It's unbelievable. Yes. Got up the so, earliest you've ever gotten up to do this, Yeah. Right? <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's a hard job and sometimes we have to sacrifice. But yeah, I got up <laughs> at four right. in the morning yesterday um, and I met the folks um, from Breitling and Lewis Air Legends. We flew a Warbird mission around Lake Winnebago here. And if you've ever camped at, at Air Venture, one of the wake up calls would be the warbirds cranked up and flying yeah. around at 6 30 a.m. in yes. the morning. Even and the aerosol guys. Yeah. I mean, it's like they're so. I know loud. you can hear it in Appleton, probably. It's you know, crazy. I mean, yes. you stay in a house nearby and you, it's a definite, you don't need to set your alarm. But no. uh, I wanted to thank them for that mission. There's going to be a video posted to that at AAPA.org. And also, um, we will also have a, a slideshow. But that was awesome. Yeah, I just want to take a minute to thank the folks at Brightling and Lewis Air Legends. But, you know, I was in a B-25 and it sent chills up, up my spine. Ian, I looked out mm. one of the side windows 
and a, and a Grumman Tiger Cat sidled up to the to the left awesome. flank with two P fifty P fifty one Mustangs, and I could only imagine what it was That's like awesome. during World War Two. I mean, it would be yeah. a, you know one of those missions would typically have different support aircraft and fighter aircraft and bombers on a run like that. It, it absolutely sent sent chills up my spine, and you know we're just so thankful for the folks who kept us you know, fighting for freedom back in the day. And today, the people who put their heart and souls into keeping those warpers alive. Yes. It's incredible. Yep. Yep. Very cool. That's a, that's a great experience. Um, David, let's, let's talk about the two big announcements, the two okay. things that we've left to the end, the cliffhangers. Okay. Um, the first is the sling. Now sling has been really going gangbusters. Um, they have a couple of low wings that are very popular mm-hmm but they had a very special trip to introduce their new high wing version. Indeed, Ian, the week started out on a downer note for the folks at Sling mm. because we had a, a, a severe thunderstorm that came through here on a Sunday night and they erected their normal display tent over the three low wings and the tent got blown down and the poles damaged mm. all three of their aircrafts. However, they recovered by midweek when three sling high wing aircraft arrived from a transoceanic ber- um, journey that started in Johannesburg, South Africa, folks were being, were able to follow them along the way. And the three aircraft landed, uh, say today is Thursday, Wednesday afternoon around 2 p.m. to a raucous round of applause, hugs and kisses and flag waving. And the aircraft themselves are just sexy. I don't know how else to say it. They could be a nose dragger or tail dragger version. And um, it was just really cool to watch them land. Alicia Heron wrote a story about that. Folks could find that at AOPA.org. Just take a quick search or look on the homepage. But they arrived to a little pomp and circumstance. They parked over near the home built area and then they were able to get uh, wrangled over to the sling uh, exhibit area, which is essentially 20 yards from the AOPA campus. Mm. So, yeah, it was a great uh, welcome reception for them. And kudos to the, all, all the pilots, but special kudos to um, the folks behind the scenes that were making that happen. Can you imagine flying from South Africa, crossing the Atlantic, no. And then coming up no. through the states, they overnighted in a couple of areas. They they were on the ground in Kentucky, and then they made the final push to Air Venture. And they arrived right before you know things were closed for the afternoon air show. So their timing was pretty darn good too. Well, that is good. Yeah, and I'm looking just at the website now because they had a really nice kind of follow them thing on, uh-huh. on Sling's website. Um, and so they went through Angola, Ghana, uh, Cape Verde. I've been to they it yeah. might be tough to fly through Angola, but I've yeah. There, yeah. And they didn't go like up, you know, cause of course, cause it would take them forever, but they didn't go up through Europe and across, you know, Iceland and Greenland. It was like, they went from Cape Verde to Barbados, then right. Bahamas. Um, now they had to stuff. have, they had to have some ferry tanks installed. So the airplanes yep. were modified for the trip just yep. to be, be clear about that. Yeah, but still, I mean, you're talking about I, that, that leg I think was 2000 miles, 2100 miles. Can you believe miles. that? 2000 yeah, miles. Incredible. Incredible stuff. So very cool to see them there. Um, have you been by to, to see the airplanes in person? Yeah, yeah, I have. I, I uh, documented them arriving. You know, I got a really nice moment uh, when when one of the pilots was uh, greeted by his fiance, and I, I, it was just as a photojournalist, it was the stuff that you live for. Oh, and, that's you nice. know, it was a good yeah. celebration, and uh, and it was a surprise too. But no, the hmm. airplanes are. They are right behind us, uh, literally. And yes, they are slick. I actually helped them turn off the EFIS display on one of them because I noticed that it was still on while they were smooching and hugging and stuff. I was like, hey. <laughs> you're like, you're going to have a dead battery. Yeah. yeah. So I, was, I went over to uh, to Matt Cohen, one of the pilots, and said, hey, you know, can I help you out here by turning it off? And so, yes, the answer was yes. Yeah. So um, yeah. I think folks will, um, will have a, a, a good look at them here at Air Venture. They can also, of course, you know, potentially purchase the aircraft. Mm-hmm. I want to say that uh, when I was talking to the other Matt, 
um, from California that they're in the mid $300,000 range. So it's nothing to hmm. sneeze at that is less than say a typical, Cessna yeah, typical four seater. Yeah. So yeah, that was just right. sort of how we, how we kind of think about it. The Cessna 172, the Piper, you know, T 100 I, that kind of thing, yeah. kind of yeah. in that area. Yeah. Right. Right. So, um, David, I think the probably the biggest news for the Light J fan uh, out of the show, and something that you guys teased uh, at the last show, is the RV15. So you're getting to see it now in person, um, and it is well. It's just it, Dave. I thought wrote a great story, Dave Hirschman. Um, yeah. You've got some great photos there. It's a really interesting airplane proportionally, maybe not what you expected. And you know, Ian, I was able to get a sneak peek at that aircraft with Dave Hirschman. Um, we went over to a hangar nearby. We talked to Axel Alvarez, who's the test pilot for this aircraft. Mm -hmm. He gave us a great walk around. You know, it's got a couple of things that stood out to me that were kind of cool. It's got an overhead manual flap handle. It reminded me of the Mooney Johnson bar that I had in the Mooney's, um, you know, that deploys the, that deploys the flaps. The flaps go out in to 55, zero degrees. Yeah, and there's that's amazing. A, well, and, and, and Axel wrote in Sharpie on the, I want to, it's not really a headliner cause there's nothing really lying in the, the inside of the aircraft, but wrote in Sharpie right above the, I guess the, the windscreen, mm -hmm. uh, 50 degrees dash. Oh crap. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. Right. Exactly. So it's yeah. pretty funny, but, uh, push rock controls and, um, yeah, there for folks who are watching online, Ian's showing the photo yeah. of that right now and, uh, push rock controls. It's um it's really inter interesting. It's got a large rudder and a stabilator. So mm -hmm. I think that the future might hold a seaplane version for this aircraft. Mm -hmm. Perhaps um, I do know that we were talking about the unique uh, suspension. You know the landing gear. There's um there's a pneumatic shock that's inside the airframe, Ian, that links the left and right landing gear, but it doesn't obstruct the pilot in any way it's more hmm. or less sandwiched you know underneath the the cockpit area and i'm sure they'll do some cleanup on the outside and maybe get some of the the you know metal a little bit more streamlined but that is an interesting concept and it's going to have a patent pending uh conventional tail wheel which has got sort of a trapezoidal arrangement with a vertical pneumatic uh air oil shock, which is very similar to a telescopic fork in a motorcycle. So this hmm. is some really interesting technology. Of course, Dave Hershman speculated early on that the aircraft might hold four seats. I think realistically it might be three seats. It's actually yeah. the interior of the cockpit is more narrow than you would think mm -hmm. when you look at it. But the a really cool aspect of it is the doors are just clear glass. They came off on the test aircraft. Anyway, they came off by pulling two pins. So I could see this as a, perhaps a photo ship for hmm. the kind of um, aviation photography that we do sometimes. Very cool. Or, yeah. or in, in any kind of a backcountry ship, it would be really neat to be able to load more stuff in that way. It is going to have a baggage door on it, uh, by the way, which wasn't on this one yet. And Ian, when they unveiled it here at AirVenture, they actually moved the unveiling up a day because there was so much so much interest. And uh, you know, it's this year's Van's 50th anniversary anyway. Mm -hmm. But that unveiling, the physical unveiling at 10 a.m. that day, drew a huge, huge crowd, and yeah. people were climbing all over that airplane. And yeah. it's just it was fascinating. Yeah. Well, and if and if the initial interest is any indication this thing is going to sell faster than they can build it, which is already kind of a problem for a lot of the kit manufacturers. Um, they said people are sending in unsolicited deposits. Right. So I guess it's like you send them a big fat check and you're like, I want an RV 15. I don't know what the but deposit is, but I want, but one. they're sending them back. Uh, they send Van, them back. Yes. No, Dick Van Grunsman told us they're sending them back. In fact, if yeah. folks could listen to the, um, to the video, you know, there's a nice little interview with, uh, with Dick Van Grunsman on that. But he said, he told Dave Hirschman and I that they are sending the money back because yeah. they're not ready. Yeah. They're not quite ready. It's a proof of concept, you know. Yeah, yeah. I think That's it's right. going to happen for sure. And I think people will be lining up for that, bucking rivets and ready oh, yeah. to go with that bad boy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, 
um, obviously a departure for Van's aircraft because all yeah, the high others wing, have been, sure. yeah, low wings and, and not, you know, back country has absolutely not been a focus, but the, they're smart to go this way because obviously there's a lot of growth in that area. We see sure that is. from cub crafters and Aviad and, and all kinds of others who are getting into that area. Obviously the experimental community is huge there. So uh, yeah, I love it. We can see on the video now those those clear doors. That's so cool. Oh, it's fascinating. I, I don't see why more manufacturers won't do that. I mean, that's a yeah. great idea. You know? Yeah, it's very cool. Um, and I love you can stand up under it. It's it's really oh, yeah. quite tall on yeah. the gear. Yeah. So, you can yeah, stand you're not going to whack well, your head. Well, well, it is tall, but I will tell you this, um, that the, um, the test pilot and the engineers told us they really scrutinized that deck angle, Ian, or mm -hmm. taxiing and on the ground maneuvering yes. there there's yeah. a definite balance that vans aircraft was seeking they didn't want it to be too severe of a deck angle yeah. where it would hinder taxing that much so the i've not taxied yeah. it time of safety. course yeah right right but that safety is a big part of the van's total picture mm -hmm. so it it's not as severe of a deck angle as you would think on a tail dragger design like that and there was a reason for that also you know we're taking a quick look on the video in on the interior the stick itself the control stick has a little bit of a bow in it so that you could slide the seats knees forward in. and backwards yeah, yeah get in and get your yeah. legs behind the stick uh without you know without getting jammed in there so there was a lot of yeah. human touches you know human factors involved in this aircraft yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. I think it's going to be a big winner. Um, I think, you know, they're going to see big time sales, especially from a whole new group of folks. I mean, I think there were, uh, the company is starting to garner some more folks who are coming from the certified world and are just want more for their money. Um, I think we've seen that in the past couple of years where it used to be obviously primarily home builders, but I think um, this will draw many more from the certified community into that experimental community. And I think there'll be a big demand for something that's just been ramping up the past couple of years, which is these, um, professionally built experimental airplanes. So contracting out the build so that, uh, an owner can have the airplane they want, but doesn't have to be involved in the build process if they're not confident or not interested in doing that. Right, right. You are. And speaking of the build process, I want to say that, you know, uh, the aircraft has their normal looking wing. It's mm -hmm. a constant cord wing that makes it easier for builders to build it. Yeah. Um, and there are um, instead of there, instead of, you know, two people bucking rivets, the the way that you do this, are, it's a pull rivet design. Pull rivet, yeah. um, and so, you know, I've never done that before, but I can understand how it could be easier and it mm -hmm. could be a solo one person job. Yeah. But, that's um, right. so that's yep. another, you know, design characteristic, a build characteristic, if you will, to kind of simplify things. And, um, you know, those Fowler flaps were just amazing. I mean, that's, <laughs> I can't tell you how big those flaps are. It's just it's tremendous, but, yeah. um, and I'm with you. I love that overhead pull handle. That's, that's very cool. I love stuff. that. It's a great idea. Yeah. You know, when you see yeah. some of the, um, back country style competitions, other aircraft have something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. it, it, and so it, it, I guess that might help you out when you've got your hands on the stick and the other hand is up there. I, I don't know. I haven't done a much stall S T O L work. But mm -hmm. I would imagine having complete control, manual like that, and not having an electric motor really gives you that finesse that you need. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. David, I think I think we covered the big stuff. I think that's We had some big it. stuff to cover, um, Ian. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you're, as they say, you're here all week. Um, so I'm sure there'll be more. You're drinking your Dunkin'. Yeah. There, there'll be more uh, I am. to report on that we'll talk about in the next show. And of course, we'll go back to a normal format, have a guest. But for now, I know you have got a very busy day, so I think that's all the time we have. Ian, thank you very much for uh, for being with us, you know, on the other end of this and trying to keep us walking the straight and narrow. We had a great time here at EA Air Venture broadcasting this for Hangar Talk. I want to also remind folks that um, this is now going to be our seventh season that we're fixing to enter. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much to the two or three listeners that have stayed with us yeah. this whole way. <laughs> Well, I think we're up to four or five by now. Yeah. Well, we are. We are. And a uh, special shout out again to Austin Hansen for helping produce this audio all through the years. And Ian, mm -hmm. it's such a pleasure to host this with you. We've got some great positive feedback here at Air Venture with folks that have come by to say hello. And so awesome. saying hello to us is uh, meaningful. We want those questions. We want y'all to be involved. Mm -hmm. You know, 
join us when you can Uh, join us when you can in the audio or on the video but thanks again and i'm going to sign off from ea air venture here at the aopa campus at oshkosh all right we'll see you next time thanks david see ya